I'm Richard Brown from Mississippi State University, and along with Christy Yeager, we're pleased to begin by with a presentation with an overview of Lepidoptera. We're going to start in uh, reverse by starting with number five. Get number five. Use the cork on the block, and I'm going to position it here. And you see where I've got the moth right now positioned? I'm going to focus in on it. So put your number five in the same position. I'm actually going to invert it this way because I don't like to read upside down. And zoom in. And what do we see here in this specimen? A moth. <laughs> Some of you uh, may not have a complete specimen. Do you see the labial palpi? How would you describe them? Right there they are. There's my, the apical segment on my palpus is missing. What kind of palpi are they? Drooping? Correct. They are correct. You see the compound eye, correct palpi. Now let's move that specimen. I'm going to stick it in the cork at an angle. I'm going to put it at an angle so you can get this view so that the wings are sort of sticking out towards you. You can see the top of the head. I'm going to zoom in. You see the base of the antenna, the edge of the compound eye. Zoom in all the way right there. You see that little lens that she's encircling? That's the ocellus. It's like a separate little eye. So this moth has an ocellus. Just posterior or behind the ocellus are the ketocemata. The ketocemata are these specialized hairs. You note right behind the ocellus there are very short hairs that stick out at angles. This is an innervated structure. It's got a nerve going to it. It's an organ and its function is unknown. The ketocemata has no function even though it's innervated. It's present throughout most of the Lepidoptera. It is absent in the Noctuoidea. It's present or absent, but if present, reduced in geometroids and the same for the pyroloids. But it's present throughout the microleps. This ketocemata is distinctive of the family Tortricidae. This moth has correct palpi. So what's the family? I just told you. Tortricity. So here you see the ketocemata, which are present in tortricids, but they are not present in uh, many of the other uh, Lepidoptera. Now, let's go down in magnification. Here is the wing pattern. Now, based upon that wing pattern, can you see the median fascia going straight across the wing? This median fascia is broken right at the middle, as I mentioned, often it's broken, so that you get a spot on the costa and a large spot on the dorsum or the posterior margin of the wing. You can see vestiges of a basal patch or the subbasal and basal fascia here. Between there and the median fascia are the interfacial scales that typically are a lighter color. And then at the towards the apex, you get a compound fascia that represents the spots of the pre or the postmedian and the preterminal fascia that are all lumped together. This is a very common pattern in tortricity where you get a patch of two fascia right on the costa. You get a median fascia that's broken near the middle. This is true of many of our domestic tortricity as well as some that are we're looking for on caps and we don't we want to intercept them if we see the adults. Let's go to the next specimen which will be number four. We're going to look at it from the head end. Now I'm going to zero in on it. You see the compound eyes. You see the antenna. What other structure appendage do you see? The proboscis. Is it scaled? A scaled proboscis. So what's the family? 
Pyroloidea, superfamily. Uh, it could be a Gelichiid, uh, but it's a little bit large for a Gelichiid, and it lacks some of the other characteristic characters. Now, a word of warning, there are some uh, Pyroloids with a reduced proboscis. But even in some that reduced, I have seen a few scales on the very base. But there are some without a evident proboscis. Again, let's turn at an angle and look at the head. Sometimes structures get in the way. See if you can find the ocellus. You see the ocellus? It is present. Are there ketocemata present? The scales will be flat. Ketocemata are like round hairs. They're very short and they come off at different angles. They'll, they'll go out almost in a star, uh, you know, like a pattern of a starlight. And here there are no ketocemata. I'm sorry, for number four, some of, they're not all one species. The one I was showing does not have ketocemata. And if you have a white or a striped, if your moth is not black and polka dotted, you may well have ketocemata. So I'm going to put this other specimen up. And this one is a paraloid. And Christy, can you see the ketocemata? Right, right in there. Okay. So this one has ketocemata. For paraloids, present or absent. So you've seen both conditions. Look at the base of the hind wing. Do you see a frenulum? In this case, there is one spine, and uh, the pyralids are, I mentioned a bad example, because sometimes the females can be one, but most of the time, the male has one spine. Can you see the spine at the base of the hind leg? Does anybody have a spine with more than one? We will get another ex example that has sexes that are alternating between your and your neighbor, and you'll be able to see the... The last thing I'm going to point out here on the legs, I'm going to zero in on the hind tibia, and there are two sets of spurs. There's one, there's the other. This is a general condition with Lepidopter, two sets of tibial spurs on the hind leg, but there are exceptions. The middle leg will have one, but these are the tibial spurs on the hind leg, tibia. No other leg has four. Let's now go to specimen three. Now here, we're going to swap number three with your neighbor because one of you will have a female, one will have a male. Here, my specimen has the hind wing somewhat separated and you can see the single spiniform frenulum. This is a male. This is retained by the retinaculum, but the point is it's one spine in the male. Now, in practice, uh, you have to be careful because I have seen females that have three spines that are stuck together. But if you focus up high enough, you can see they're actually three separate spines. If you can't see it on one side, look at the other side of the moth. If you're working with a paraloid, you may want to use another character. And I look at the tail end, I can see those ovipositor pads at the end of the abdomen that are hairy. And so this is a female or like a clamshell for the valves closing, and I glance at it, male, female. I usually don't look at the frenulum, to be honest. I just look at the tail end. But if it's very hairy, it can be more difficult. Okay, the question uh, was whether or not females can have one, two, or three CD. And indeed, uh, there can be two or three, and even four, in some females of families. In the Pyroloidea, you can have only one Ceta in the female. So this character does not always work for Pyroloidea and perhaps for a few other things, but in most cases, the multiple sp spines on the base of the hind wing is present only in 
the female. And you can see in this uh, image that's being projected, you see how those multiple spines are going underneath some scales. It's not like the retinaculum in the male that's like a flap, but rather these are scales that are directed anteriorly instead of the flap in the male that is directed posteriorly. So there you have the female and you can separate the two sexes of the moths. Of course that can be important if you are concerned about a female being introduced that's maybe fertile, carrying eggs, and you can determine whether or not it is male or female. So we're going to look at the, the, the nation and identify the veins. After we talk about um, the, noted, uh, the noctuodia, we will separate the veins of those families that are associated with the not uh, noctuodia. But here, I just want you to look at the veins and be able to identify the subcosta, the radial veins, the median, and the cubital veins. When we look at wing venation, I want you to put the moth upside down on the foam number one. But stick it in the foam on the edge of the board. I don't know if you can see that. Not in the middle of the foam, but stick it on the edge so that the wings are projecting out off the board. Can everyone let me get into the light? When we look at venation, we want to look at the ventral side or underside of the wings because there's fewer scales. Often on the forewing, you can have two or three layers of scales. On the underside, often there's only one layer. So it's thinly scaled and more easy to see. Okay. If you look on the right side of your microscope, there's a little switch. See if you can toggle that to turn on the light underneath. In front of you is a vial that has histoclear. This is a citrus oil. You don't want to get it on your fingers and rub your eyes, otherwise it's not toxic, but it can, I know from experience, it can sting if it's in your eyes. Histoclear has various kinds of uh, trademark names. Uh, this is Americlear, Histoclear, but this is what I use for looking at venation because you can drop it at the base of the wing and it will bleed out. You want to get that wing in position to where you can see if that cubitus appears to be three or four branched and you put, take your straight tip forceps and close them and then stick them into the histoclear while they are closed. And then when you touch the wing with the forceps still closed, that histoclear will bleed out onto the wing and you'll watch it in amazement as it spreads across the wing, revealing the veins. Get your moth positioned with the lights on to where you can see the forewing, as is shown in the screen and on the wall. And then I'm going to do this right now, is touch the base of the forewing. You don't want to touch the tip, but I'm going to touch the base. And watch what happens. Everybody direct their attention to the screen. Presto, we have veins. We see the cubitus, first two cubital veins. We see another vein coming off near the cubitus. Which vein would that be? Two cubital veins. How many M veins are there? Three. So that would be M3. You can always add more histoclear if you're not getting a real good image. And the, if you've got a light coming from just underneath the microscope, or what I do, if I've got a light, a lamp that's on a neck, I'll aim it underneath the wing instead of on top. And that makes it a whole lot easier to see the veins. But this is a very nice way, using this compound, to, to show the veins. And you can see that I'm brushing some aside. Whoops, I just destroyed the wing. 
the, in this area of the wing, these are the R veins. Can you see on the screen what I'm pointing at? Those are the R veins. And coming from the base here is the subcostal vein. And I just tore the M veins away from the body. You can see the hind wing venation as well, but uh, when we get to the noctuodia, we will determine whether or not that is a trifid or quadrifid hind wing. And just looking at it now, what do you what would you guess? For the hind wing, here is is the the subcostal vein. Here is the second CUA2. This is CUA1. What would this vein be? M3. So in this situation, the cubitus appears to have three branches, even though it only has two. That's because that third median vein comes off near the cubitus, so the cubitus appears to be three branched. And that is a key difference between separating erebids from not noctuids, and we will look at that and compare those in our lab after our next presentation. Are there any questions at this point? 